Welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Wiam Hamouda. I'm an assistant professor at the Institute of Community and Public Health at Birzeit University and part of the leadership collective for the Palestine Program on Health and Human Rights, uh, which is a joint program between the FXB Harvard and Birzeit University. Um, and you can visit the website, which has been shared um, in the chat option and the chat box. And I'd also just like to point out that we have a call, an ongoing call for our, our inaugural um, in residence uh, fellow uh, in health and Palestinian health and human rights. Um, set to begin uh, next year and um, so the information is on the website there. Uh, the, our webinar today is our first webinar of the, of the academic year and it's on a very important uh, topic. So we'll be examining um, various aspects related to the health, human rights and um, of Palestinian political prisoners. And just to give a very brief context, and our moderator will elaborate on um, this and our speakers even more so. Uh, currently, there are 30 Palestinian political prisoners that are on an open um, hunger strike. And these prisoners are protesting essentially their administrative detention, which means that they have been incarcerated without any charges. Um, and these 30 are 30 of almost 800 prisoners currently um, incarcerated. Um, so our speakers today will look at various aspects, uh, especially related to health and human rights. Our session will be moderated by Randa Wahba, who is a graduate student at Harvard University and, a, and was formerly an advocacy team member at the Mir um, organization, which is also one of the organizations that's been recently targeted um, by Israel and deemed to be one of the terrorist organizations, a claim that's um, been uh, largely found to be unfounded and politically motivated um, uh, by many. Um, and from Adamir, we also have Sahar Francis. Uh, Sahar joins us. Um, she's the she's a lawyer and director of Adamir Association. Um, she has over 20 years of experience um, in front of military courts and civil courts and a long experience in international human uh, rights law and international humanitarian law. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Lina Qasim Hassan, um, and she, who's a family physician that, uh, volunteering with Physicians for Human Rights Israel. She is uh, for over 20 years, and she's recently been elected as um, the board chairperson um, of the organization. And in the last 10 years, she has examined hunger strikers and has provided them with medical support. We thank you for being with us today, and we look forward to what I'm sure will be a very lively and important conversation. Uh, and I'll hand it over to you, Randa. Thank you so much, Wam, for that kind introduction. I am honored to be here to moderate this important panel. Um, before I turn over the mic to our panelists today, I want to reiterate what Wam said is that this panel could not be more timely. Eight days ago, on September 25th, 30 Palestinian administrative detainees launched an open hunger strike in protest of their arbitrary detention. And ever since, they've been subjected to increasing punitive measures, including being put in collective solitary confinement, denied salt with their water. Two of those prisoners are in complete isolation and they're being denied access to their lawyers and family visits. We'll hear more about this um, later on in this panel. If you don't know what administrative detention is, Israel uses this policy that dates back to the British mandate to imprison Palestinians without charge or trial. What happens is that the Palestinian is served an administrative detention order under the guise of secret evidence that neither they nor their lawyers are privy to. These orders can be renewable for up to six months at a time and as in the case of many of the detainees today, their administrative detention orders have been renewed multiple times and they continue to be languish in the state of being held in detention without charge for years. Um, Israel uses administrative detention systematically against those who are vocal and active in demanding liberation for Palestinians. Most administrative detainees are former prisoners who recently completed their sentences, activists, human rights defenders, academics, students, political leaders. Um, and historically, tens of thousands of Palestinians have been subject to administrative detention policies. 
Just in the last five years alone, nearly 6,000 administrative detention orders were issued by Israeli intelligence and confirmed by the courts. And we also are witnessing a huge spike in the use of administrative detention since the Palestinian Unity Revolution in 2021, as Israel attempts to fracture this growing movement against settler colonialism. To give you a sense of that, today there are about 700 Palestinians in administrative detention, including four children and two women, while in the past few years, the numbers had hovered around 300 or 400 administrative detainees at any given time. So this shows that this is indeed a policy that is directly related to Palestinian resistance and is an attempt to try to cripple and crush any kind of unity and any kind of movements that Palestinians have. The way um, Israel uses administrative detention against Palestinians is not only illegal under international law, but it can be considered tantamount to psychological torture for both the detainee and their family, which I'm sure we will be hearing about more on this panel today. Um, for the detainee, they're languishing in a state of waiting without the ability to do anything about their detention because they cannot even build a case considering they're being held under secret evidence. For families, they're also in a state of waiting. They're often unable to visit their loved ones, speak to them. They don't know how they're doing. They're unable to plan for the future. Often the detainee is the breadwinner for the family, putting the entire family in a precarious position, and it completely derails the detainee's life. For example, if they're in university, they will lose a semester and have to prolong um, their time at the university before they graduate. They're unable to have job security since an administrative detention spontaneously halts their life. They miss important family events like wedding, births, deaths, without ever knowing when they will be back with their family and back home. Moreover, um, and I remember this from my days working at Adamir, is that Israel often cruelly waits until the last day of the detention order to renew it so that the families continue to be waiting in suspense. And then they have their hopes shattered when their loved one does not come home because the administrative detention order was renewed on the last day when they were supposed to be released. This policy could not be more cruel. Um, many former administrative detainees have told me that they would prefer to be sentenced rather to be in suspense under administrative detention because they have no recourse, they have no ability to fight for their release. And this is why today 30 administrative detainees are on hunger strike to protest this policy and demand the release and the cancellation of the policy in totality. And administrative detention is just one of the cogs of the brutal carceral regime Israel uses against Palestinians. And I just want to give a quick overview. Palestinians in the West Bank live under military law, which means that over 1,600 military orders control every aspect of Palestinian life and try to thwart any part of civic life. This means that Israel controls our roads, our pro ability to protest, renovate our homes, attend events, and even carry the Palestinian flag in some places. These laws are are meant to control every part of Palestinian life, and the widespread use of arrest and detention shows this. Um, since 1948, it's estimated that a million Palestinians have been arrested by Israel. That constitutes one-fifth of the Palestinian population and over 40% of the male population. So when we're talking about this carceral regime, it's not just about the arrest itself, but it's this entire system of incarceration that's meant to break the will of the prisoners and by extension, the Palestinian nation. Arrested Palestinians are often subjected to extremely harsh interrogations and torture, including psychological torture and increasingly in the past few years, physical torture. Nearly 100 Palestinians have died in custody as a result of torture. And of course, there is no accountability for this. Um, there is widespread medical negligence where prisoners are not afforded any medical treatment, which in turn exacerbates their medical conditions to the point of death in some cases. In recent years, we're seeing more older long-term prisoners, um, and we're witnessing more prisoners dying in prison slowly as a, as a result of untreated conditions such as cancer. 
Prisoners suffer also from overcrowding in the prisons. They're not even afforded basic rights like access to education, clean food or water, regular family visits, or even enough times outdoors to see the sun. They're forced to buy their most basic necessities such as food, clothing, shoes, blankets, toothpaste, soap. Um, and all of these goods are bought from the prison canteen, which is privatized at three times the cost of goods outside. Or sometimes they are heavily fined for any perceived infraction. Um, for example, in my time working at Adamir, some of the prisoners during that period were fined for using too much water to clean their cell, just to give you an example. And this is one of the ways that Israel also uses the prison system to financially capitalize off Palestinians, or as we know it here in the US, the prison industrial context, uh, complex. So these are just some of the conditions that drive Palestinians to overtake, to undertake hunger strikes over the years, just to fight for their most basic fundamental rights, such as cots in their cells or the right to cook their own food because the prison food is contaminated. Um, last October, 250 Palestinian prisoners started a hunger strike to protest the policy of solitary confinement and other collective punishment measures imposed on them after the prison escape in September 2021. So oftentimes the hunger strike is the final and only resort that they have in order to gain any of their rights and any of their dignity. And as we know, a, a hunger strike means that you are refusing food and therefore your body is undergoing life-threatening conditions, which can sound like a death sentence for many. Yet hunger strikes are the ultimate expression of the will to live. Hunger striking prisoners are shifting the power dynamics between them and their jailer, and they're demanding that they're being treated on their own terms. It's an incredibly courageous form of protest that not only demands freedom, but also dignity and hope. It's a recommitment to the values of liberation that the, palace, the prisoners espouse. So given that, I would like to give my last words before turning over our speakers to the 30 hunger strikers themselves. And I want to just read a short excerpt from their statement that they released on September 25th when they launched their hunger strike. And their hunger strike is under the umbrella slogan, our decision is freedom. The beings of this earth deserve life. And to the enemies of humanity, we say on this land that it is worth fighting so that we can live. And in the context of our continuous struggle, we embark today on an open hunger strike. Our demand is, clean air, a sky without bars, a space for freedom, and a family gathering around the table. The demand of the occupation is to separate us from our social reality and our national humanitarian role to turn us into dry fragments. Between our demand and their demand, the occupying power carries out the abhorrent policy of administrative detention. Wherever we find a space of struggle, we cut the path and raise the sword, realizing what awaits us, repression, abuse, isolation, confiscation of our clothes and photos of our children, being thrown into cement cells devoid of everything except for our bodies and our pain, constant searches, ongoing transfers, no cigarettes, no bottles of water, we can care barely catch a breath of fresh air. And yet, despite the slow killing, we announce our cry. Rejecting the injustice and struggling against it is food for our souls flying in the sky of our homeland. Through this struggle and with the support of our resisting people, we will create a bright tomorrow. With that, I would like to pass to Sahar Francis, who is a lawyer and the director of Ad Damir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association, to speak a bit about the history of hunger strikes. Thanks, Randa, and thanks for the Harvard uh, School for initiating this timely webinar uh, while the 30 administrative detainees are in uh, hung open hunger strike against the administrative detention. As you described, Randa, in your introduction, the hunger strike is not a new tool that the Palestinian prisoners use in their resistance uh, against oppression and torture and all kinds of violations that they face from the first moment of the arrest till the last day in, in prison. Historically, it was used since early years of the occupation, uh, like the first collective hunger strike was already in 1968 when the prisoners were uh, uh, 
striking in order to guarantee to get a mattress because they were forced to sleep on the floor without any other uh, uh, not mattress, not a sheet, uh, all uh, like in order to guarantee their dignity as human being behind bars and not to lose this dignity uh, 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 while they're imprisoned. And of course, they were using the hunger strike mostly in the early years of the occupation and later on uh, up till the 90s actually as a tool in order to guarantee their life conditions and their basic rights inside the prison, which means it wasn't a political uh, resistance against a political decision by the Israeli uh, prison authority or the Israeli security, or uh, uh, even once they had a political strike after the Oslo agreement against the Palestinian authority, because they were not included in the exchange in the agreement, the, agree the Oslo agreement was not including exchange and release of prisoners. The importance in the uh, uh, hunger strike of the Palestinian prisoners that it was always accompanied with a huge support from the Palestinian people outside, from the organizations, from the political parties, from the family members, from the public in the uh, Palestinian uh, reality where Always the hunger strike of the prisoners were supported by massive uh, uh, demonstrations, by uh, having tents in the different cities. Some family members would initiate their own hunger strike as well. The uh, uh, harsh experience of the hunger strike was in the 80s, and especially in the long hunger strike in 1980 that lasted for uh, uh, more than one month. And then the Israeli prison authority used uh, the forced feeding uh, uh, against some of the detainees in Nafha prison. And uh, three of them died of the uh, policy of the forced feeding. Uh, uh, two died immediately and one he died uh, later. And then was the first time when the Israeli high court decided that forced feeding is a, a, a policy that is not supposed to be used by, and actually they ban the use of force feeding. And since then, the prison authority wasn't able to use force feeding, but it always was kind of threatening detainees that they will go back to the use of force feeding, especially after the uh, legislation that came uh, in 2015 when the Israeli Knesset approved for the first time, the force feeding uh, bell. And uh, um, it should be highlighted so that since then it wasn't used because actually, and I think Dr. Lina can elaborate more on the medical consequences of this uh, history, but the, uh, uh, the low, the uh, patient low in Israel enables the use of uh, forced treatment in order to save lives. And this is what was used actually in some of the cases of the Palestinian hunger strikes, st individual hunger strikers actually in the last couple of years, that when they were losing their conscience and without before losing the conscious, we are saying that they don't want to be treated. So the doctors were forced to treat them and save their lives. So after the 1980s, actually, the uh, hunger strike were more used as a last resort, as Randa said, because they were resisting in so many different ways, actually, in order to guarantee their rights, starting from negotiations, sending back some meals a day, uh, uh, disobedience uh, actions like not standing when the police comes to their room, to count them three times a day and so on, refusing to go out for the recreation time in the yards and uh, uh, ending up with the use of the hunger strike. Not all of the collective hunger strikes were successful, actually. We faced failures as well. For example, the 2004 hunger strike that lasted just for 17 uh, days and it was ending at, unfortunately, without succeeding in guaranteeing any of the demands that they were asking for, because they, they were picking a time that 
politically on the in uh, uh, Palestinian discourse, it was when uh, Arafat was in in under a siege in his al uh, and there was no much public support, and this is affected as well movement and unfortunately the prison authority succeeded in cheating the prisoners because by the years the prisoner uh, the prison authority as well developed strategies how to defeat the pr the prisoners one of them is isolating the prisoners totally those under hunger strike especially the leaders of any hunger strike in solitary confinement banning lawyers visits family visits of course automatically would be cancelled totally from day one of the hunger strike and moving the prisoners from one prison to another so they cannot communicate and organize inside one prison and lead this uh, hunger strike and of course uh, they were starting in 2004 they started to eat the prison guards and to do barbecue under the windows of the cells where these prisoners are held. And they were uh, convincing the prisoners in other prisons that those in Ashkelon prison, uh, uh, Ashkelon then at that time was the leading prison in the hunger strike, that they ended the hunger strike. And this is how they affected the hunger strike. Later, uh, actually, the collective hunger strike of 2012 was a very powerful one because it was very well planned and it succeeded to force after one month in a collective hunger strike they reached an agreement with the prison authority that included ending the solitary confinement of all those who were held at that time under solitary confinement reducing the number of administrative detainees reactivating the family visits of the Gaza prisoners because from 2007 up till 2012, all the family visits from Gaza were totally canceled by the Israeli prison authority and it was reactivated after the hunger strike. Uh, but since 2012, the prison authority uh, uh, started to punish the prisoners for this success. And actually this is why it ended up with lots of other initiatives in these years against uh, such uh, violations and restrictions on the educational level, on the health issues, on the family visits, on the use again of the solitary confinement and all the other punishments that they were facing. But what started in these years actually, and especially in 2011, December 2011, by the individual hunger strike of uh, Khadr Adnan that it was the longest at that time hunger strike as an uh, uh, one administrative detainee initiates his own individual hunger strike that lasted for 64 days, followed by Hana Shalabi and then several administrative detainees initiated their hunger strike. But it's very important to highlight that uh, uh, he wasn't the first one in 1997, 98, Etafi Alayyan, as an, a woman under administrative detention, went into 42 days of hunger strike against the policy of administrative detention. But since 2011 till today, there's tens of administrative detainees that they decided to initiate their own hunger strike against the policy of administrative detention. And Brenda described perfectly what administrative detention is. But the hunger strike wasn't the only a tool that they are using against administrative detention, especially this year, the administrative detainees as a whole group, more than 500 administrative detainees at that time, started in the first day of January 2022, is try a boycott actually against the military court procedures, the review process, the appeal, and the petition to the high court against the policy of administrative detention. It lasted for several months, but unfortunately were not effective. The uh, prison authority and the security service increased, especially the security service, increased the use of administrative detention uh, 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 based on the uh, claim that there is a security threat because of the, all the tension that took place since last May 2021 till uh, today. 
And especially in the last couple of months, there is a significant increase in the issuing of new military orders of administrative detention. This is what brought the current administrative detainees to initiate this collective hunger strike, because if you examine the cases of these detainees, you would find some people that they already spent 17 years, 18 years on, uh, on prison as a sentence to be rearrested a couple of months or one year after and to be sent for administrative detention. Our colleague Salah Hamouri, a human rights defender that last year and, and, and in the case of Salah, it's a very clear policy of intimidation, harassment, and persecution from the security service. Because Salah, uh, he was an ex-prisoner, but since 2011, he's facing uh, uh, every while and he often he re-arrest, whether under administrative detention uh, um, or expelling him from his city, Jerusalem, forcing him to go to live inside 48 areas, or banning him from entering the uh, West Bank the, in the occupied territories. Uh, till actually in October last year, they revoked his Jerusalem residency. And a couple of months after, in March 2022, they arrested him under administrative detention that was renewed already two times. The last time it was renewed literally in the last days. He was preparing himself. His family was expecting that he should be released, but instead it was uh, uh, extended and he's now under hunger strike. So currently the 30 detainees, 28 of them, they are held in offer detention facility. All of them, they are isolated in four uh, rooms, separated from the other regular uh, sections. Salah uh, is held in Hadarim alone, and he's isolated in uh, solitary confinement by his own. And Ghassan Zawahri isolated in, uh, in Naqab uh, a prison. Salah and uh, Ghassan, their conditions is a bit more harsh because of course, uh, under such conditions without family visits, without communicating with the rest of the detainees, they are totally isolated. I'll stop here and would be uh, happy to get questions and to discuss more things that I missed in my uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Sahar. Um, I would also like to encourage everyone to use the Q&A um, button on Zoom to be able to drop any of your questions for the question and answer session afterwards. And I would like to pass it to um, Dr. Lina from Physicians for Human Rights to speak about um, the medical uh, point of view of hunger strikes. Thank you, Rhonda, and thank you all for uh, this important webinar. Uh, I would like uh, to bring uh, actually the uh, medical point of view. Uh, I have uh, been volunteering in uh, Physicians for Human Rights for about 20 years, and uh, in the last 10 years, I uh, examined uh, like tens of hunger strikers. Uh, and uh, in my experience, uh, I want to talk about my experience and I want to bring the medical point of view. Actually, the definition of hunger strike according to WMA is the World Medical Association is uh, uh, that a person who is fit uh, to make a decision uh, refuses decides to refuse food and uh, food and flus or foods or fluids, and uh, uh, he um, he does this for a significant uh, period in order to achieve a specific uh, demand to achieve a specific demand. Uh, there is also there are two kinds of uh, hunger strikes. Uh, there is an absolute or complete hunger strike, which is uh, more dangerous. Uh, it uh, includes refusing uh, uh, getting uh, any food and any uh, extra vitamins, minerals, and sugar. And there is partial hunger strike, which includes uh, uh, getting uh, min uh, minor minerals, uh, sugar, and vitamins, uh, which are essential nutritional uh, factors in order uh, to survive. Uh, actually, the risk of a hunger strike depends on, uh, we divide it, uh, uh, into two levels. Okay, there's uh, high risk and low risk hunger strike. The high risk hunger strike includes people who are 
uh, old in age, uh, people who have uh, prisoners who have uh, also comorbidities and other chronic illnesses, and they are in a, a bad general medical situation before the strike. Uh, and uh, the low risk are the young people who are not, uh, they don't have any comorbidities and who, who are usually healthy, uh, which is the mo most of the, uh, of the hunger strikes that I, uh, I examined. So uh, that's why they can survive longer times uh, than others. Um, actually, um, as the Sahara State, State and Randa said before me, it's actually a, a tool that is uh, started in the world in, 19, in 20th century. Uh, it's, uh, it's a nonviolent tool uh, that is uh, effective ideological tool uh, in the struggle of uh, minorities for their rights. Uh, and uh, we see many examples along the history, like uh, the women's strike in 1909 for women's uh, the right to, to vote, uh, the Mahatma Gandhi strike in 1932 and 1943 in the struggle, anti-colonialistic struggle. And also the most famous uh, hunger strike in the world, I think is the Irish uh, hunger strike uh, in 1920 as a part of the Irish independence war. In that strike, we saw that um, uh, many strikers died uh, through a forced feeding also, like uh, the Palestinian uh, prisoners that Sahar talked about. Um, actually, um, there are many international uh, medical decla declarations uh, that are, um, that uh, talks about ethical codes uh, uh, that for people who, for, for physicians who are giving medical care to uh, hunger strikers. Uh, the most uh, important one is the Malta Declaration in 1991 uh, that uh, says that the physician should respect actually the wishes of the hunger strike striker and uh, he has a, a full right for self-autonomy. Uh, the fact actually that the prisoner is, is a prisoner doesn't uh, rule out of him uh, the basic human right. He still deserves to get um, uh, good medical care a good empathic medical care also uh, and uh, he decides for his body okay he has self-autonomy this is a basic ethical rule actually uh, in medical ethics um, what i would i would like to say also um there are many uh, enormous actually ethical dilemmas <laughs> with the treating medical uh, 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 hunger strikers um, as a physician uh, when I uh, come to check uh, or to examine hang a hunger striker, I, uh, first, first of all, it's a big trauma for me. Uh, and uh, it's really not easy because you, uh, in the last, uh, last one in Awaudi, Khalil Awaudi, uh, I uh, entered uh, the room of the, he was uh, admitted to the hospital, a Safarofe hospital, and he was uh, um, shackled to the bed by handcuffs. And he was extremely, extremely um, underweight. He like 38 kilograms or something like this. And he was extremely sick and he can, could barely speak. He was very confused. He had a severe cognitive impairment and it was a very, a, it was a, very bad to see him in this situation. I asked, um, immediately asked the guards, there were five, guards like standing there, he was still arrested. And uh, I asked them to remove the, sh the handcuffs immediately uh, because I can't uh, check, I can't examine him when he is uh, handcuffed because uh, he will see it like I'm collaborating with the system that uh, in is incarcerating him. So uh, this is the first uh, ethical dilemma actually. Also as a physician who was educated and uh, who, who was educated to, to give uh, care and to give a cure also and to treat a patient. It's very difficult to see a dying person uh, and then not be able to give him any medical care. It's really difficult. Uh, and I can understand the frustration of all the physicians uh, that are dealing with hunger strikers. I, I see my um, 
my um, central role in, in giving medical care to a um, hunger striker is actually um, building a trust with him because there is a very big trust problem. It's trust is actually very crucial in a patient-physician relationship. Uh, and uh, in the case of hunger strikers, there is no uh, there is no trust in their doctors and their physicians because actually when the medical situation is deteriorated, they are referred to uh, the Marash. The Marash is the uh, Israeli Prison Service uh, Medical Center, and this Marash is uh, actually a prison, and it's not really a, a medical center. It's actually a prison, and. Uh, the, the the physicians in the in the marash are uh, seen by the prisoners as uh, jailers as uh, as guards they work for the shabas okay for the israeli uh, prison services and they are committed to the shabas they are not committed to any ethical uh, to any other ethical codes uh, and uh, that's why there's a big problem of trust and this is the role of, uh, I see that my role as a physician uh, that comes from a human rights organization is to build this trust and to give uh, the prisoner uh, a real uh, picture actually of his medical situation, uh, to explain to him uh, uh, where he stands and uh, what is expected for him. And that helps him actually to make uh, decisions uh, about the strike, about the continuing the strike and uh, also um, actually the prisoners are um, facing hostility uh, from every uh, possible uh, uh, interaction with the medical uh, community inside Israel. Uh, that's uh, very sad to say because, you know, physicians are have an oath uh, to give uh, good medical care, empathic medical care for all people, and not regardless of what they did or where they come from. And we don't see that happening with hunger strikers inside the hospitals in Israel. And uh, when we come to see after 100 or uh, days of hunger strike, to see this very ill young man that decided to struggle for his freedom, and he. Uh, he faces only hostility and the only person that comes and uh, is make it clear to him that it's makes it clear to him that uh, I, I am on your side. I am here to help you. I am here to help you getting through this. And um, it's very, um, I, I want to say in, in about this case, because it's still imprinted in my mind because this is the last case and it was very strong experience actually he he hold he hold my hand hold my hand and he said don't leave me I want you to stay because I know that they will uh, uh, put back the handcuffs and this is the only thing that bothered him he I talked with him about you know the the risk of death uh, the risk of uh, of uh, irreversible organ damage and all he cared about is. Uh, to, to be free from these handcuffs. Uh, it's really a torture for him in his very bad situation that he was. So um, I want also to talk about uh, what happens actually to, the, to our body in a hunger strike, in very prolonged hunger strike. In the beginning, actually, um, the body burns uh, all the reserves of the glycogen uh, to produce uh, uh, sugar and uh, and all the nutritional factors that are needed to survive. Uh, then in the next step, actually, uh, it starts to burn uh, the fat, and then it starts to burn actually the muscles. And after 28 year, uh, days, uh, sorry, uh, after 28 days, we see actually um, severe muscular damage, and uh, it's which is irreversible. And uh, many uh, hunger strikers that stop the strike after. Uh, like uh, I heard about Maher al Akhras, who uh, I think strike like for 150 days or something like this. He uh, he still can't uh, walk. He didn't uh, get back to himself actually after stopping the strike. So there is really a permanent 
damage uh, that can stay with them uh, and they could ne can never uh, get back to themselves and that's uh, very bad. Um, also, uh, after uh, actually for 35 days, uh, we can see uh, lo loss of uh, hearing loss, um, visual loss, uh, they can see, they can hear. Um, there are disturbances in the um, minerals in the, uh, in the body, uh, and uh, which uh, is dangerous also for the heart. It can, uh, it can happen, arrhythmia, sudden death can happen after 55 days from any reason. If, uh, that's why we demand actually them to be referred uh, after 30 days to the hospital in order to be monitored and in order to interfere in any case of, uh, of that something uh, that can happen suddenly. Um, and what, what I, how I see the, um, in my 20 years volunteering in the Physicians for Human Rights, I, have, uh, I said, as I said, I have examined several hunger strikers and, and uh, I also work as a family physician. And in my work, I um, like accompany terminally ill patients uh, with cancer. And uh, lately I uh, just, uh, uh, I, um, I, I understood that my experience is very, very similar in the two uh, cases, but the terminally ill pa patients are terminally ill because this is like God's want, but this, uh, the, the hunger strikers are in this situation. They are dying because somebody forced them uh, to do this because they are, this, this is the only way they can protest for the conditions they are living. Uh, they talk to me about how the administrative uh, detention destroyed their lives, uh, their families, um, the, those families that have no idea what's happening with their loved ones in the prison. And uh, in the cases that uh, the detention was uh, frozen. Yes, the detention was frozen. The, the families could uh, uh, visit actually the, the strikers in the hospitals. And uh, in these cases, uh, when I saw the families, uh, I could see the fear in their eyes and they, they, they looked very lonely in the hospitals and, and very lost because they don't know what's going to happen with their husbands or their sons. And it's very difficult to see. They, they also need us families, not only the prisoners. Um, I want to say that I see in this policy, the, the administrative tension as a, actual, actually a, a tool of the Israeli authorities to break the morale of the Palestinian people uh, in its struggle to get its dependence, uh, independence. And, uh, and, and it's causing, actually, it's also a personal trauma for uh, for the prisoner and his family and the whole village, but, also, but it's also a collective trauma for all, for all the Palestinian people, as you said before, Randa. And thank you, and I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you so much. I just want to take a moment to thank you both for your tireless work on the ground, both advocating for prisoners in the courts and in um, the hospitals. It's not easy work. It's tireless. Um, it's not, it's thankless work. And it's very difficult, as you said, Dr. Lina, to see people deteriorating like this and feeling very helpless and unable to do something. Um, from there, I just want to take a couple of questions and remind people that they can put questions um, in the Q&A button on Zoom. Um, the first question I would like to ask um, is what you see uh, for both of you, what you see the role of international bodies when a hunger strike takes place. I know the ICRC, part of its mandate is to protect prisoners, to enter prisons, to um, to uh, make sure that the health of the prisoners is adequate. Um, what, um, what do you feel like their role has been during this period as a lot of the families of prisoners are required to go through the ICRC to find out anything about um, anything about the detainees when they're on hunger strike and what else can be done and also um, I can expand this to like the World Medical Association for example or the Israeli Medical Association. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe I will elaborate about the role of the ICRC and the role of organizations uh, like Domir and the other Palestinian and Israeli organizations. So in the hunger strike, usually the ICRC would be the only international body, of course, and the only body that can meet the detainees in person in their sections before being transferred to the uh, out uh, uh, to the hospitals or to the Ramli uh, detention facility. Unfortunately, the ICRC were uh, not implementing the expected uh, visits that we felt like it's needed. And we're we, now that current hunger strike, it's too early to judge. We are not aware about uh, uh, special circumstances though for the detainees on their health level. But of course, if the hunger strike will continue, of course, we will start to document deterioration in their health conditions. And this is, would become more uh, uh, worrying because the ICRC then what they, how they will manage because we are talking about 30 detainees. It could be that the prison system will divide them in between several prisons in order to make it more difficult for the lawyers, for the families, and for everyone to track. So I think that the ICRC should uh, enhance and pressure more in order to be able to visit and implement their work. On the level of the legal work that we do as organizations, usually the lawyers would be able to visit the detainees. In some circumstances, we, the lawyers, face as well restrictions. Uh, very soon they will start claiming that the detainee is not here. He was taken for checks in the medical center. So you organize the visit and then you will not be able to visit and so on. So this is why it's very, very important, the advocacy and the, uh, uh, in the campaigning and especially students and activists around the world to join the campaign around the hunger strike. Maybe we can discuss more about the actions and the specific campaign that the Palestinian organizations are supporting the current hunger strike with. I want uh, to add also that, um, unfortunately, uh, we uh, see that the Israeli Medical Association is not involved at all, and we didn't get any comment from them uh, a, long, uh, a long time. Every time we, we in any, in, in any, uh, uh, any issue, not only in uh, this issue. So uh, we we declare that we stopped actually our our uh, interaction with the Israeli Medical Association. And uh, two months ago, we actually complained to the World Medical Association about uh, the uh, very negative role of the IMA of the Israeli Medical Association in this field. Um, uh, we in Physicians for Human Rights actually um, uh, did a brief for the diplomats in uh, Israel in order to explain uh, the uh, situation of, uh, of Khalil Awawde when he was in his last uh, days of uh, the, uh, the strike. And um, uh, we also, um, I want um, to thank, to thank uh, the, with us, uh, the, joined us uh, the Knesset member, the pro-Palestinian Knesset member, Alfer Kassif, uh, who is known to be one of the biggest supporters of the hunger strikes. And he visited them all the time in uh, Kaplan and in Asafar Hospital. And uh, I want to thank him for this. And uh, he has a very big role of uh, uh, actually uncovering uh, uh, to the media, uh, all um, what's happening with the hunger strikes, strikers and their families. And uh, he asked me to send his uh, regards for you. And uh, he's very thankful for this webinar. And um, I, th I think that uh, uh, the World Medical Association is uh, supposed to take action in these cases. Um, and uh, the, uh, the international advocacy has an a, a very important role in this field. Thank you. Um, we're running short on time, so I'd like to pose a question from the audience from Sima Abujode. 
who says, incredible panelists, thank you so much. As a current Lebanese PhD student in public health in Boston, I was wondering how you believe as academics and as activists, we should best elevate the plight of the Palestinian prisoners and how we can keep the conversation going as underlying systematic violence by the settler state. Uh, maybe as I said, to uh, be more vocal and to join the current campaigns, and maybe this is the opportunity to highlight the cases of Ahmed Manasra, the boy under solitary confinement, as well Nasser Abu Hamid, that he's suffering from cancer in a very late, like uh, uh, last stages. He's about to die and still the prison authorities are insisting to keep him to die inside the prison. Ahmed is facing solitary confinement uh, uh, while his psychological uh, uh, situation is so uh, uh, bad and in order to keep the case of the Palestinian prisoners on the spot, we need to talk about them. We when we need to send letters maybe to the diplomats and the uh, uh, representatives to the uh, authorities in the United States, in other countries, in the European countries, in the UN as well to pressure them to take actions. All these practices, it's a lack of accountability, actually. As you mentioned in your introduction, the torture, the arbitrary detention, uh, 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 the violations that they face that amounts to war crime, it's not investigated. It's not, no one would be found accountable in the Israeli judicial system. So it's our role to bring these cases to the international level and to do like, the uh, report that Domir and the Harvard uh, uh, Legal Clinic did and submitted, it was a very important step that we did in order to focus and highlight about the military court system in the context of the apartheid. So I think if we think we can find lots of activities that we could be involved on in order to continue supporting the prisoner's case. Great. Um, as, so we don't run over time. I just want to thank you both and see if you have any final comments for this panel before we wrap up. Um, if Dr. Lena or Sahad, if you have any final comments. Great. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I urge you to follow both of these organizations. Adamir is on social media, on Instagram and Twitter. Physicians for Human Rights has an excellent website with a lot of resources. And to also visit the Palestine Program for Health and Human Rights website. Um, there will be updates on these websites, um, particularly the Adamir website about ongoing actions you can take for the um, hunger strike that's going on right now and um, various other resources. So we thank you all for joining us today and for um, particularly to our panelists, Dr. Lina Qasim Hassan and Sahar Francis for being with us. Um, we hope you have a wonderful day and please keep um, the hunger strikers and the Palestinian prisoners on your mind as we go about our days and to remember that they are fighting every day with their bodies for freedom and we should be standing there with them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rana. Thank you.